I'm, I'm going to start kicking off talking about the, in some international monitoring programs, so zooming out a bit from the freshwater phase and looking at what's happening more broadly across the North Atlantic, and in particular what's happening with salmon at sea. Very brief overview of, of just a few programs that I think are quite interesting. And one of the most important things that we do on the international stage, I think, is estimating the total abundance of Atlantic salmon in the sea. Uh, this is done every year by an international group of, of experts from across the North Atlantic. We all bring our data from our national jurisdictions together to estimate stock components in these three broad categories. This is part of the IC's working group on uh, North Atlantic salmon's work. And the ultimate aim of this work is to provide uh, advice to international fisheries negotiations on what kind of catch might be expected uh, to allow enough fish to escape those distant water fisheries that may be operating in West Greenland and not more in the Faroes, but we still provide, we still provide catch advice on, uh, on, on those stocks as well. These are mixed stock fisheries, so how many fish could you catch and still let enough get back to our shores to have sustainable populations? That's the ultimate aim of that group, but in order to do that, we have to first estimate pre-fishery abundance. So how many fish exist prior to any fisheries uh, exploiting them? And this is, these, these data are, are uh, aggregated at the, these large stock complex levels and then also across the entire North Atlantic scale. The top panel here is just total PFA, pre-fisheries abundance, and these two panels are what would, what would be maturing one sea winter fish and then fish that would eventually return as multi sea winter fish. <laughs> and I just want to underline a few uh, key patterns. The first one is that the declines that we see are widespread. This is something that's occurring across the North Atlantic and also the co-variation that we see across stocks in the North Atlantic really points to the fact that there's a real issue at sea. Plenty of issues facing salmon in fresh water, as, as we're all aware of, but there's going to be more heterogeneity and variability in the relative importance of those. There's also something that's affecting salmon at sea uh, across their range. Secondly, there's some interesting differences between North American and European populations. North American uh, population stocks sort of declined and have stabilized in more recent years. And that's probably largely driven by um, uh, populations in, in Labrador and the northern parts of, of Canada. And northern versus southern, southern European populations, the decline in southern European populations is particularly marked. And then finally, we do see in recent years a sort of shift towards multi-sea winter fish in more recent years, more multi-sea winter fish, and those stocks sort of stabilizing compared to one sea winter fish at this again at this broad scale. So we're really talking about aggregated level data. These data are, just because it's been mentioned a few times, this is what's found, uh, uh, provided the foundation of the assessment for the IUCN <coughs> red listing. So being able to zoom out and look at things at this level is really valuable. But it's, as John mentioned, it's not just, just the numbers of fish, but the size that we're really interested in, because we know that the average size of fish has been declining in recent years from, uh, from long-term monitoring programs. Uh, as John mentioned, we're starting to, to fill this gap here in recent years by working with FMS members to sample fish on the return uh, from, from the sea. So that's really valuable work. Why do we care? Smaller fish, produce fewer eggs. So in recent years, we need more fish than we did in, say, the 1970s to produce the same amount of eggs. And that's, that's the problem, really. So what's happening, what's driving this decline in, in length uh, in particular? One way we can look at that is by looking at scale growth. So that's something I'm particularly interested in myself. And, and at present, we're focusing on this first period of growth at sea, the early post smoke growth. And across uh, several stocks in, uh, these are across a bunch of stocks in northern, uh, across the whole of Norway, uh, across channel populations down in southern Europe, and across North American populations, we see quite a large and marked decrease in the early marine growth. So, and it's very coherent across many stocks, again, 
pointing to a similar problem driving some of these changes, uh, very particularly marked in, in European populations as well. Now, the differences that we see among stocks and across the eastern North Atlantic and the western North Atlantic point to there being some variability in where salmon are going, what they're feeding on, and how they're growing while they're at sea. So the, another uh, main aspect of, of, of studying what's happening to salmon at sea is trying to better understand where they go. This is some recent work that in, involves some, uh, a scientist at the, at the Marine Directorate looking at pulling together all the available information from research and commercial trawls on where post molts have been caught at sea and normalizing that for, for effort. And it's been very valuable to see the aggregations of post molts along the uh, continental shelf edge moving on up into the Norwegian Sea in that first summer. And this aggregation here was really dominated by southern European populations, which they could tell by, by looking at the genetic uh, um, uh, stocks, uh, identifying those stocks through genetic means. And that's, that's really interesting, but it only takes us so far in the salmon's life history, so right up to that first summer of, of growth. We don't know much about what's happening beyond that. Another way of studying that is looking at tagging adults, um, kelts in this case, with satellite pop-off tags. It can only be applied to large uh, salmon, so kelts on their way back out to sea because they're quite large tags. But when we look at this across, again, across a North Atlantic scale, what's been really valuable to understand is that there's quite a lot of variability between stocks and where they're going, but also fish are going to areas that are much farther north and, and, and much further east in some cases than we would have perhaps known or thought about before. So that kind of information has been really valuable to help us understand where fish are and when they're there. But again, kelts are uh, maybe potentially quite different to maiden fish. We, they might not be having the same kinds of behaviors. And these pop-off tags tend to only last a period of months. So another way we're interested in studying where fish go is by looking at the uh, microchemistry in their otoliths and their ear bones, sampled from fish that have already returned to our coasts, and by looking at the chemical properties of the otolith and combining that with some information on how fast fish can travel and how well they're growing, we've created some movement models to try to understand the likely migration pattern of individual fish. And these are just a couple of outputs from a one sea winter fish and from a two sea winter fish over here. And that's work we're hoping to develop and also hoping to apply to stocks across the North Atlantic to provide a bit more insight into where fish are. Finally, as I hand over to Ian, I just want to uh, reiterate and point out that there's a, quite a well-established body of evidence and one that's increasingly growing mm -hmm. in the interaction between freshwater experience and growth and survival of salmon at sea. So these things absolutely cannot be viewed in isolation. Um, the water quality, salmon uh, smolt growth, and smolt emigration timing are all really key, critical to their success at sea. So everything that we can do in fresh water is where we ought to be focusing our attention. Thanks very much, Noah. Um, <clears throat> so moving from the marine environment to the freshwater environment, I just want to give you a very quick overview of two national scale monitoring programs in Scotland that are really important collaborate, uh, collaborations between Marine Directorate and FMS members. And it's only through the collaboration with FMS members that we can realistically get this large scale Scotland wide perspective on things. Two things I'm going to cover are the National Electric Fishing Programme for Scotland and the Scotland River Temperature Monitoring Network. You've already heard a bit from uh, previous speakers about those. For those who aren't familiar with them, the National Electric Fishing Programme for Scotland was established back in 2018, and it aimed to provide an assessment method for understanding the status of QDL salmon populations, particularly at subcatchment scales, and also to provide information on pressures and to help people to identify where they might want to target management actions. Three key components to the NEPS programme, the first one, was the development of this benchmark, which was a previous piece of work. Again, using data from FMS members, we were able to devise a model that would let us understand how many fish we should have in a particular habitat, in a particular bit of the country, if the fish populations are healthy. 
the second component of the next programme is a statistical survey design. This lets us get a representative, unbiased sample that covers all Scotland's rivers and lets us obtain information on fish numbers, but also on pressures, things like water quality and intergression. We can then combine this information on, the, on how many fish there should be with how many fish we actually see to give us an assessment of status and whether the fish populations are performing well or otherwise in particular locations. And we can take both the performance and the abundance data and the, and the pressure data. We can bring all this together and summarize it at lots of different spatial scales and inform these assessments of pressures, which pressures are important locally, which ones are important nationally, how should we target our efforts? And of course, this can then feed into fisheries management planning, which you're going to hear about later on today. Just to give you a feel for the sort of data that we get out of NEPS, these data are from 2021. There was a recent NEPS program in 2023, but we're still analyzing those data. Uh, the 2021 sample came on the back of two years of really poor spawner numbers. And these are data just for salmon part. Here in the top left hand panel, these are the site-wise assessments, so in the, for each individual site, how many fish we were seeing at the sites. The black points indicate where no salmon are observed at all, and the increasingly light colours tell you where the density is the highest. What you can kind of see is that the highest densities continue to be observed here in the north of Scotland and also down at Hebrides. If we combine this information with information on how many fish there should be, which is what we see in this right hand panel, and what we're looking for here are, are blues and greens indicating things are good and reds indicating things are not good. And again, what we see is that the, is that the fish populations that are responding best are the ones in the of Scotland. Uh, but you can also see there's lots of variability within catchments, and it's this sort of information that lets people target uh, monitoring and action at those sort of finer spatial scales. These data are available online in a variety of different formats. If you want to go and have a look at them, then you can have a look at things at much smaller spatial scales for individual catchments and individual sites, and you can export all the data and make use of it for other practices. So I mentioned the importance of getting some information on pressures at the same time as understanding whether the fish are healthy or not, what might be causing them not to be healthy. We know there's a prevailing issue in the marine environment. There's also a lot of heterogeneity in the freshwater environment. I just want to talk about two particular pressures here. One, one of which is becoming an increasing problem, and one of which is a declining problem. So the first one here uh, is, is uh, nutrients, and we're representing this through inorganic nitrogen or nitrate. Um, what you can see here is we have spot samples collected in 2018, <coughs> 2019, and 2021. And these spot samples, although they're not telling us about absolute levels or absolute concentrations, what they do give us is a very good picture of inter-site variability of where particular problems are occurring. Now, at low concentrations, nutrients can be incredibly important, providing uh, enhanced food opportunities, feeding and growth, um, and, and increased production of salmon. But once you get to high concentrations, we can get eutrophication issues, we can get uh, uh, harmful algal blooms, and reductions in dissolved oxygen, which are a problem for some salmon populations. You can see here, particularly, we've got lots of high nutrient concentrations right down on the east coast, a little bit down uh, towards the southwest. And to the central belt, these are from the agricultural sources, and these may be more urban sewage type sources. The second pressure that we've got here um, is, uh, is relating to acidification. Here I'm just showing some pH data. You can see the same persistent patterns across the years. Uh, acidification used to be quite a substantial widespread problem across Scotland, but with reductions in acid deposition and improvements in forestry practices, it's not the same problem that it once was. Nevertheless, we can still see that we've got low pH and acidity problems, particularly in these locations down in the southwest of Scotland. So, in addition to collecting water samples and providing information on water quality and potential pressures there, we also obtain genetic samples at the time of sampling. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, we obtained um, uh, genetic samples only from the multi part electrofishing data. In 2021, uh, the results haven't been published there, but we obtained um, genetic samples from all of the sites. And when we take these genetic samples, we can bring them back to the lab of Lockery, compare them with a specific set of markers that identify um, the effects of uh, the introduction of armed fish genes into the wild fish populations. Oh, sorry, can I go back? Um, so we can, uh, we can basically identify the amount of genetic material from farm to fish that's been introduced in wild populations. And this is a problem because 
<coughs> the farm genes can make the wild populations less well adapted to the environments that they're living in, and it can make them um, less liable to survive both in the freshwater environment and in the sea. You can see here, in terms of the spatial distribution uh, of, the, in, of the introgression, it's largely confined here to the west coast, where we've got a high concentration of fish farms and potential for fish farm escapes. We also see some examples in the freshwater environment, particularly uh, on the nest of the Shin, where we've got freshwater production facilities and the potential for escapes from there as well. So the second uh, monitoring uh, program that I want to talk about is the Scotland River Temperature Monitoring Network. This was established around a decade ago now. And at the time, there was no systematic national monitoring of river temperature in Scotland, but people were recognising that river temperatures are likely to become an increasing problem under climate change. We set up the programme with the aim of understanding the spatial variability of river temperature and the controls on river temperature, but also to identify where we might target management action, particularly through riparian tree planting. The initial network consists of around 220 sites. These are distributed across the whole of Scotland and across a wide uh, range of environments. We can then combine um, these monitoring locations with some spatial statistical models, and that lets us predict the temperatures across the country. So we now know where the rivers are hottest and also where they have changed most under climate change. These sort of models can be uh, used to predict river temperatures on any particular day in any particular river across the country. And the animation that you were just seeing before was from 2018. And then during 2018, we found that around 70% of rivers in Scotland experienced temperatures that caused thermal stress above, above uh, 23 degrees for at least one day or more. And by 2050, we expect these conditions to occur every other year. So we're seeing this as being an increasing problem going forwards, and we want to target management action. So now we know where the rivers are hottest and where they're going to change most, and that provides a starting point for prioritising riparian tree planting and investment. But we also want to know, well, where can we plant trees that actually has a large effect in reducing river temperatures? So not just where are they hot, but also where can we reduce the temperatures the most? So we complemented that earlier statistical modelling with some process-based modelling. And what we did is we simulated for lots of different rivers of lots of different widths and lots of different gradients and orientations and what we did was to look at the shortwave radiation gain in these rivers, and then we planted up some trees in them, and then compared what happens with and without trees in terms of the shortwave inputs. We then combined that with information on how much water is in the rivers and how fast that water flows. And that then lets us understand what sort of temperature differences we get by, half, by moving from position with no trees to position with trees, and then we can turn these into uh, some, some uh, tree planting uh, target maps. If we take those two things and put them together, so where is hottest, where is going to change most under climate change, and where can we be most effective in reducing river temperatures, we've then got a basis for trying to target uh, management action and also for targeting resources and, to, and financially. And as you've already heard today from earlier speakers, this was this was uh, uh, these these maps or these uh, targets. We're incorporated alongside other priorities for tree planting because tree planting can have lots of other benefits in terms of reduced diffuse pollution and, um, and various other things. And so these are all brought together and uh, incorporated under these riparian benefit target areas. And that offers an enhanced rate for tree planting and opportunities for FFS members to plan out and, and, and receive money to plant trees across, across Scotland's rivers where they're going to be most heavily impacted and where they can have the greatest benefits. So just to quickly summarise, uh, Nora's already identified that stocks are declining across the North Atlantic and the marine freight is particularly important and an overriding feature. We know that uh, growth has been substantially reduced in that early phase and there are new methods available for understanding where fish are going and how they're interacting with the environments that they're, that they're moving to and the food resources that are available there. Nora also mentioned some of the carryover effects in terms of water quality and growth and timing uh, of arrival at sea and how these could all affect survival once they arrive in the marine environment. So we know the freshwater environment is important in that context. And we also know there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in terms of how fish are performing in the freshwater environment. And in that context, it's important that we have a set of methods that can help us identify where the fish are performing well or less well, because that lets us target management action. And it's also really important that we have information on the pressures that allow local fisheries managers to provide an assessment of what they should be doing 
to help the fish in those areas where they aren't doing well. And that can inform management both now and in the future. And I know you've got talks later on about the fisheries management planning process, and that's obviously provides an exceptionally good framework for addressing these issues. And with that, I'd just like to thank you and particularly thank all the FMS members for their contributions to these national monitoring programs. Without them, it wouldn't be possible at all to run a program like the National Life Fishing Program for Scotland or the Scotland River Temperature Monitoring Network. Thanks very much.